We are starting on time because Professor Stieglitz has to leave uh, on time as well. Um, we are living in exciting times. Thank you very much uh, for everybody to be here today. Um, uh, my name is Maria Malchnik. I am the director of the Karl Renner Institute. Uh, and we organized this event um, together with our European partner, the Foundation of European Progressive Studies, uh, and also with the Austrian Institute of Economic Research, also known as WIFO here, and the Vienna University of Economics and Business. We are very honored to have Professor Joseph Stieglitz here today. Uh, the reason why we invited him um, to speak to us here in Vienna is that uh, together with the Foundation of European Progressive Studies, he recently published a report called uh, Rewriting the Rules of European Economy. Um, unfortunately, all of the printed copies um, are gone already, but you can download uh, the report both on our website and also on the uh, on FEP's website. Um, in the preface of this report, Joseph Stieglitz writes, and I quote, the economy is not an end in itself, but a means to an end, to improving the living standards and well-being of the people within the country in ways that do not impose harm on people outside. Quote end. For way too long, the economy has been treated as an end in itself. This has caused a dramatic inequality, the biggest economic uh, crisis in decades, and uh, very obviously a loss of people's confidence towards public institutions, politics, other people. Uh, the report, rewriting the rules of the European economy, analyzes the recent social and economic developments. It claims that the rules of the European economy are no natural law, but can and should be rewritten. Professor Stieglitz will speak to us in a minute, but before, I would uh, like to thank uh, the rector of this university, Edeltraut Hanabi Ecker, uh, that we can be here today. And uh, I will kindly ask her to take the floor for some uh, introduction. Thank you. Well, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, dear Professor Stieglitz and dear Mrs. Schratzenstaller, I am very delighted to welcome you all um, at the most beautiful university on the world, I would say. <laughs> at VU Vienna. It is, of course, a great honor to have Professor Joseph Stieglitz, Nobel Prize winning economist and one of the world's best known in his field, here to present his report, Rewriting the Rules of the European Economy. Let me say a few words about Professor Stieglitz, and believe me, this is a really difficult task to say a few words only. Professor Stieglitz was born in 1943. As graduate of Amherst College, he received his PhD from MIT in 1967, and he became a full professor at Yale in 1970. And in 1979, he was awarded already the John Bates Clark Award, given by the American Economic Association to an economist under 40, who has made the most significant contribution uh, to the field. Professor Stieglitz has taught at Princeton, Stanford, MIT, Oxford, and so on and so on. And he's now a university professor at Columbia University in New York, where he is also the founder and the co-president of the university's initiative for policy dialogue. He's also the chief economist of the Roosevelt Institute. Of course, Professor Stieglitz, not only in my eyes, is one of the most influential economists in the world. His work has helped explaining the circumstances in which markets do not work well and how selective government intervention can improve their performance. Professor Stieglitz's work has been widely recognized. In 2001, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics 
for his analysis of markets with asymmetric information, and he was a lead author of the 1995 report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which shared the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. In 2010, he was awarded the prestigious Loeb Prize for his contributions to journalism. In 2011, the Time named Professor Stieglitz one of the 100 most influential people in the world. And of course, it would cost too much time to list all his awards, honorary doctorates, and recognition he received. However, allow me to mention one very, if not the most important one. In 2002, Professor Stieglitz was awarded the honorary doctorate of WU Vienna. In 2015, he was already visiting us, talking about his book, The Great Divide, Unequal Societies, and what we can do about them. And today we have another chance to discuss a white, uh, what we might call hot topic, namely rewriting the rules of the European economy. I thank the organizers for the great opportunity to host this event. I wish you all an inspiring discussion and dear Professor Stieglitz, I may say, welcome home. Good to have you here again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as an alumni of this university, I'm very happy uh, that we can be here today. And as a former student of socioeconomics uh, at this university, I'm particularly happy that the chair of the department um, of socioeconomics is here today. Uh, Professor Ulrike Schneider, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, it's always a pleasure to welcome back our former students in, on such pleasure, uh, pleasant occasions. Um, well, I'm the chair of the EU's Department of Socioeconomics and Professor of Economic and Social Policy. And my department is proud to support today's event. And on behalf of the Department of Socioeconomics and all of my colleagues, I'm delighted to welcome all of you who are here this afternoon. And I'm extending a particularly warm welcome to today's speakers, namely Joseph Stieglitz, but also Margaret Schratzenstaller, who will give an Austrian view on the recommendations we will hear soon. And also a warm welcome to the organizers and supporters of this event, in particular, um, the director of Karl Renner Institute, uh, uh, Ms. Malchnik, and also the general secretary of the Foundation for European Progr Progressive Studies, Ernst Stetter. So thank you for being here. Today, we gathered to talk about the safeguards we need to put in place to promote an equitable and sustainable development of European societies. And this is an important topic. The rules governing our uh, European Union, in particular, are essential to how our society functions. Economics, as a discipline and as a science, is about investigating which rules benefit society as a whole. Society as a whole. And discussing the quality of governance and institutions easily takes us beyond academic debate. It relates to trust in our governments, trust in our institutions and trust in experts, all of which are primary concern in the current Austrian policy discourse. <laughs> May I quote uh, what Professor Stieglitz told about today's topic a couple of years back, namely in 2004, and I think uh, some prophecy comes through, I don't know. So you, you wrote for the Gunnar Mördal lecture in Geneva 2004, as Europe faces basic constitutional questions. The relations between politics and economics, including the institutional structures for decision-making and constitutional restrictions on national governments cannot be avoided. So I think <laughs> still valid this, this quote and we're looking forward to hear more. 
from, from your side. So we are thus fortunate in three ways uh, to have uh, Joseph Stieglitz with us today to share his insights and expertise on how to rewrite the rules of the European economy. First, he focuses on a vital and truly important issue, a pressing issue. Secondly, he's, a, he's here at a perfect time and place to discuss this issue. And thirdly, Josef Stiglitz is in many ways a role model for scholars in general and for the socioeconomic research community in particular. Let me explain the last point. Research in our department, uh, the Department of Socioeconomics, is focusing on sustainability transformations. We address global issues such as climate change, population dynamics, access to health, or populism. Our research draws on plural approaches, is applied and policy-oriented. Thus, to us, today's panel is just what the doctor ordered. Joseph Stiglitz has been calling for inclusive and sustainable societies. His work on well-being metrics beyond GDP has reminded governments to value statistical infrastructures, which is a matter of resources and independence. And last but not least, Joseph Stieglitz demonstrates that academic work can be a compass to guide policy decisions. We are looking forward very much to his advice on how to rewrite the rules of the European economy. And we are also delighted that Dr. Stratzensteller from the WIFO in Austria offers an Austrian expert opinion on these recommendations. The presentation is based on a book project rewriting the rules of the European economy. And this project has been a collaborative effort by a number of outstanding scholars and has been supported by the Foundation for European Progressive Studies. I will now give the floor to Ernst Stetter, representing the foundation, to provide you with some details on this thought-provoking book. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Honorable Professor Stieglitz, dear Joe, uh, Honorable Rector of the University and Honorable Chair of the Department of Social Economics, ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, dear friends. Uh, yes, there was a process, yes, and it's a pleasure also that we can present today this report we have done together with Joe Stieglitz from Columbia University and with the Initiative for Policy Dialogue. Uh, when we talked first on that uh, question uh, to do this report, uh, we were sitting together in New York at a, at a seminar and um, uh, Professor Stieglitz has um, in his work with the Roosevelt Institute, earlier work, just published uh, rewriting the rules of the American economy. And this was at the time when uh, the, uh, at the, time when the crisis uh, hit it really hard a lot of the European countries, uh, the financial crisis of 2008. And in that sense, uh, uh, he proposed why not doing a similar publication together with outstanding European scholars. And I have to underline that this process was a real kind of intellectual discussion and debate with Professor Stieglitz and outstanding European economists, and it was a process we brought together uh, in a two years or two and a half years period of time with a lot of seminars, with a lot of debates, and also with enormous exchange of emails. And I think we can be very proud on what has been uh, so far achieved, and then we were able to publish uh, this spring uh, this report rewriting the rules of the European economy. Uh, I have to say, uh, and uh, my colleague Maria Malchnik has already mentioned that, that we had some printed copies here. They are out uh, because they have been distributed also at the Congress of the European Trade Union, which is taking place right here next, next door. But uh, the uh, publisher of Professor Stieglitz, Norton Publisher, will publish the book uh, 
I think, this autumn, and there will be also some uh, uh, copies uh, then available in the normal bookstores, also in German language. So there will be a translation also of this, of this report. We are talking today, and I will be very brief because we have to give now the floor, we are talking today on the presentation on some of the points, of the strong points, and uh, I'm very happy that one of the main chapters of this book is taxation. And I'm also very happy that uh, it was possible that we have included uh, the tremendous uh, kind of uh, knowledge uh, from uh, our colleague and especially from Margaret Schatzenstaller, who is the deputy director of the Austrian Institute of Economic Research, because she has contributed a lot to that what we are discussing in the book, uh, what can be and what has to be done in the field of taxation, in the field of a smarter taxation, and in especially relevant when we talk about top income taxation and we talk about corporate taxation, corporate taxation. This is something which is in the heart also of the European debate at the moment, and I think the report gives a lot of indications on that, and uh, I would like also to ask uh, uh, Joe Stieglitz also to elaborate a bit on that. Thank you very much for your attention, and thank you also very much that you have come so uh, numerously here uh, to this event this afternoon, and I have also to thank uh, Maria from the Renner Institute that it was possible together with uh, the Vienna University to organize this. Please, Joe, the floor is yours. Well, it's a real pleasure to be back here again uh, uh, at uh, your university and to be talking about uh, rewriting the rules of the European economy. Uh, let me give a, uh, spend a few minutes talking about the background uh, of, of this report and, and th then go into the context and then we'll have, hopefully have a conversation uh, and a question and answer. Uh, the background is very simple that neither the United States or Europe have been doing very, very well for the past uh, 40 years. Uh, there's been low growth and most of the growth uh, has gone to the top. Just a few numbers, uh, U.S. growth uh, is about two-thirds of what it was uh, in the decades after World War II. Europe is even a smaller fraction of the growth after World War II. And uh, if you look at a graph of what's happened uh, to the bottom 90% over the last 40 years, um, when I show that picture, it looks like it's the horizontal axis. Uh, it looks like it's a flat line, o almost uh, nothing has happened. Whereas if you look at what's happened to average income of the top 1%, it's soared. And that's true both in the United States and Europe. Uh, Europe is a little bit better, uh, but you have to use a microscope to see how much better uh, it is. Uh, but, uh, and if you look at it with a microscope, you can see a little growth, but it's basically stagnation. And when I said uh, the bottom 90%, I want to emphasize, we're not talking about poverty here. We're not talking about the people at the bottom. We're talking about uh, the bottom 90%. Uh, in the United States, you know, we always do the things uh, bigger than other countries, so we do inequality uh, better than other countries. So uh, we have the most inequality of any of the advanced countries. But the numbers uh, are really striking and give you some insight into the political problems that the United States is having. But in a diminished form, uh, they are also, this is affecting Europe. And I think your expectations were higher, so your disappointment is greater. Um, the um, median uh, income uh, of American families is about the same as it was 40 years ago, 20 years, 20 years ago. Next, you know, two decades of no growth. But if you look at the median income of a full-time male worker, this is adjusted for inflation, uh, and the full-time guys are the lucky ones, uh, it's the same as it was some 42 years ago. So we're talking about uh, uh, almost two generations of no, of, st of total stagnation. You know, when I give this kind of talk in uh, China, 
42 years ago, uh, median income was uh, $150 uh, a per capita, and it's increased 12, 20 fold. And yet in America, there's been no growth over a 40, 42 years for this important demographic group. But if you look at the bottom, things are even worse. Uh, the hourly wage of workers at the bottom in the United States are the same as they were 60 years ago. So if you want to understand the discontent, it's very easy. And it's showing up in lots of other, lots of indicators. When I was chief economist of the World Bank, uh, we had data showing that in spite of the fact that the transition from communism to a market economy was supposed to bring economic growth, we had data showing that uh, their GDP was plummeting. But we couldn't believe it because our ideology was so strong that we knew that bringing market economy had to bring growth. So we didn't trust the data. But when we got demographic data saying that life expectancy was in decline, we knew something was wrong. Well, the same thing is happening in the United States. For three years in a row now, life expectancy in the United States has been in decline. And among uh, white males who are not college educated, it's in significant decline. And it's not because there is an epidemic going around in the United States. There's no disease you haven't heard of. Uh, it's not about uh, a physical, uh, a, a medical ailment. It's a social disease. That uh, the, the death rate that's soaring are deaths of despair. People committing suicide, drug overdose, alcoholism, all the things that are symptomatic of a society that is not working well. And it's, you can see, if you look at a map, how it's spreading across the country. And uh, it, it is a despair uh, that is understandable given the absence of hope uh, that we've offered them. Well, this was the background for uh, the work uh, uh, that began in the United States about uh, six, seven, about five years ago. And in the aftermath of the financial crisis and the slow and unequal recovery, we began a conversation in the United States under the leadership of the Roosevelt Institute uh, into why and what could be done about it. The Roosevelt Institute is a think tank uh, that uh, uh, every president has a, a, a library uh, where his archives are kept, but many of them uh, create think tanks to perpetuate their legacy. So uh, uh, one might not be surprised that uh, the Hoover Institute uh, perpetuates the legacy of failure. Uh, <laughs> they don't call it that. It's the right wing uh, think, uh, think tank is also uh, not the right word because I really don't do thinking. But um, <laughs> it's, the right, it's the right wing tank uh, <laughs> that gathers these people together and uh, uh, share, have shared, uh, shared their, their, their perspective. Anyway, at the other extreme is... Uh, of the uh, library of uh, Franco Delano Roosevelt, and the Roosevelt Institute uh, is established to perpetuate the ideas of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and his wife, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, which have to do both with an economic agenda, but also with a social, a very important social agenda. Um, well, the conclusion of our conversations, and we held these in Washington, and we, 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 we uh, embraced a lot of uh, New York, we uh, had a lot of people engaged in them, was that the fundamental problem was about uh, power, including market and political power. Uh, the distribution of power had become more unequal, and that had led to the more unequal distribution of income. This was a theme uh, many of you may know from the progressive era in the United States, uh, the late 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, where we first passed competition laws. Uh, unlike modern understandings of competition laws, they were not passed in order just to have a more efficient economy. It was really about democracy. 
They were ba ba uh, passed in nor because it was believed that the concentration of economic power was undermining our democracy. And one of the sad things is that in the ensuing, uh, in the following 50 years, that basic political agenda got lost and it became narrowly, uh, narrowed down to those of you who know about uh, deadweight loss and consumer surplus. And, and uh, the, the economists won the day. Get, they got, made a lot of money out of it. Uh, but uh, it, it really took the eye off of the major thrust. And interestingly now, uh, this is now coming back, and I'll come uh, mention that a little bit later. Uh, we, we argued uh, that what would be needed was more than a minor tweak. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, Democrats had argued that we need more education, and yes, that was important. Uh, but that was not going to be the solution to our problem. We needed a more uh, fundamental rethinking of our economy. We needed to rewrite the rules of the American economy. And that was the um, title of uh, the book that we published uh, in 2015. Um, our basic diagnosis was that the rules of the game, the rules of the economy, had been rewritten in the era of Reagan and Thatcher, and that they now needed to be rewritten once again. Uh, they had been rewritten in the era of Reagan and Thatcher in a way that would uh, lead to more inequality and slower growth. And we explained in the book why the rules, why the way the rules have been re rewritten led to both slower growth and more inequality. And then we spelled out the ways they had to be rewritten. I want to emphasize that, uh, following up on one of the remarks that was made earlier, that behind uh, this was a clear uh, differences in views about the way the economy operated. That uh, in Reag uh, behind Reagan uh, were ideas of what was called supply side economics, but the same ideas of Reagan and Thatcher and the construction of much of Europe was based on ideas called uh, neoliberalism. It was based on the ideas that basically unfettered markets worked well, that they were naturally competitive, that all you did, needed to do was uh, lower tax rates um, to incentivize, uh, deregulate to get government out of the way, and the result of this would be unprecedented growth. And that another aspect of the idea was something called trickle-down economics, that somehow that growth would be of benefit to everybody. Uh, those ideas were very powerful and are believed still by a lot of people. I say that with a little bit of incredulity because 40 years of this neoliberal experiment should be pretty clear that that experiment failed. You know, if you try something once and it doesn't work, you say, let's try it again, and then it doesn't work, and you try it again. Well, uh, you might have been cautious to make a judgment after two years or five years, but after 40 years in country after country, and when it fails in country after country, there is only one conclusion, that those ideas don't work and that having concluded that neoliberalism doesn't work, one has to look for an alternative set of ideas. Well, fortunately, in the very period that neoliberalism was flourishing, the economics, parts of the economics profession were very busy at work creating alternative paradigms. It was just that policymakers weren't paying much attention. So, for instance, my own work emphasized imperfections and asymmetries of information and emphasized the way with those asymmetries of information you could get exploitation of those with more information and those with less information. We showed that uh, 
the reason the invisible hand, Adam Smith's invisible hand, that markets on their own lead to the well-being of society, the reason the invisible hand was invisible was it wasn't there. <laughs> and that the markets were, in general, not Pareto efficient. These were theorems that we proved. And at first, a lot of people on the right said there's something wrong. And they worked hard to prove that there was something wrong. And the nature of science is that you put ideas forward. You never know for sure whether you made an assumption that was wrong or that, that limits the domain of applicability of the, of the ideas. But after 40 years of people trying to prove that I was wrong and they failed, you have to say probably uh, the theorems were right. Uh, there probably wasn't a mistake because there are so many economists who would have liked to have published that article uh, that I'm sure it would have been published by now. So we can be fairly sure that the, 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 these ideas are, are, um, uh, uh, have, a, have a lot of validity to them. At the same time, another area of uh, growth in uh, economics was game theory. Um, people were Reinhold Selton and Bob Bauman and, and uh, David Krebs, and they explored the fact that markets are often not competitive, and that when they're not competitive, one side can structure the game in ways to take advantage of another. Another form of exploitation, exploitation of market power. So we didn't have to limit ourselves to competitive models. We had actually a lot of tools for understanding how non-competitive uh, models work. We also had insights of behavioral economics, that the basic model of human nature that was assumed by neoliberalism was wrong, that people, uh, behavioral economics taught us the, the richness of behavior related to both psychology and sociology, and that our preferences are endogenous and are shaped by our uh, society. So there were a, a lot of developments in, in economics that neoliberalism and the neoliberal policies just put aside and uh, basically ignored. Um, so our, you know, while this, these strands of economics were explaining why financial markets needed to be heavily regulated, uh, neoliberal policy agenda said strip away the regulations. And it was predicted predictable and predicted, that we would have financial crises. And guess what? We had a financial crisis. Um, the economic science said that globalization, opening up a trade between developed and developing countries, not between Europe and the United States, but between developed and developing countries, the heteroline, when the basis of trade was comparative advantage based on differences in factor endowments and differences in wage rates, would lead to more inequality among, in, in the advanced countries. And uh, it was obvious that comparative advantage meant that uh, the advanced countries would import labor-intensive goods, and that would decrease the demand for labor, and that would decrease the wages. If you believe in the law of supply and demand, which everybody in the neoliberal tradition did, that would lead to more inequality. And yet, they believed mystically somehow everybody was going to get better off without government intervention. So yes, it might have made the pie bigger, the national income pie bigger, but it would also make it more inequitably distributed unless we did something. But the Republicans in the United States and many of the Democrats uh, said, let's go ahead anyway, even if we can't ensure, because the market will take care of it all. Well, uh, as we know, the market uh, didn't. And so what we did in our book, uh, Rewriting the Rules uh, of uh, the American Economy, uh, it was called a, a, an, an Agenda for Shared Prosperity. What we tried to do is to describe how the rules have been uh, changed under the influence of neoliberalism and draw the link between that and what had then happened to our economy 
And that gave really a prescription, a way, an, an understanding of, of how to rewrite those rules to undo the damage and to create the shared prosperity. Let me just give you uh, one example before I go into more, more, um, some more of the detail. One of the uh, uh, doctrines that was propagated by Milton Friedman, uh, who was the high priest of, uh, of, of uh, uh, conservative economics, uh, was that uh, firms should ma maximize their, uh, the market value of, the value of share owners. They should only pay attention to uh, the shareholders. It's called shareholder capitalism. And he actually said it was a sin, a sin, he didn't use those words, it was, it was bad for the economy if the corporation had an ounce of corporate responsibility. He actually inveighed against corporate responsibility. He said, your responsibility is very simple. Maximize your shareholder value. That's all you should do. And if you ever deviate from that, you are, uh, uh, weakening the economy. Well, uh, that view was then embedded in our legal framework. So firms were obligated to do this. So if uh, a union pension fund has uh, owns shares, it is not allowed to uh, have, ex uh, I mean, it, 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 it's not allowed as part of its uh, legal framework to say, I don't want, I want my companies to uh, be, uh, uh, treat their workers well or treat the environment well. That's a violation of the law for them to even raise those questions. Well, we're trying to change that now, but that's an example of the extremes to which Milton Friedman led our economy. And now there's an understanding that you can't have long-running economic growth if you're focusing on short-term shareholder value. If you're focusing on what can I do to raise the value of the shares between now and next quarter, you're going to be focusing on the short term. You're not going to be focusing on, on investments, long-term investments, long-term investments in research and capital and your workers, and the result of it is you're going to have slower economic growth. So we argued in the book that actually Milton Friedman, if you want to name a name, who was responsible for the slowing of the American economy, it was Milton Friedman that led to this perversity in our uh, uh, economic framework. It's interesting now that I think we're beginning to win the day. Uh, when uh, the uh, president, uh, Larry Fink, of the largest owner of shares, uh, BlackRock, is agreeing with me. I feel a little nervous. But uh, he says that our corporations have to change, uh, that this concern with short-term value is really undermining uh, American capitalism and underwriting, undermining our long-term growth. One of the important implications of what I've just said is that creating shared prosperity was about more than redistribution. Uh, a lot of times the Democrats in the United States were criticized by the, just about tax and spend. And uh, our agenda was it was about the distribution of market income, what we sometimes call pre-distribution, about changing the distribution of market income. It was also about more than addressing the problems of financialization and globalization, though these have been shaped by neoliberalism and were the core to the failures. It was about recognizing the fundamental need for collective action, both in regulation and in providing certain essential goods and services, social protection, infrastructure, investments in research and technology, education, ensuring opportunity for all. Deregulation affected the economy, our health, our safety, and the environment. The perspective was that markets on their own don't solve key societal problems, that there is a need for a balance between the market, the state, and civil society. Well, our book had enormous resonance. It provided a new 
coherent and comprehensive agenda for the progressive movement, one which uh, would restore growth and social justice. And then many of our friends in Europe found that the message resonated there too. Even more so because much of the European construction, such as the design of the Euro at Maastricht, had been done in the era in which neoliberalism was really uh, predominant. And uh, here I want to uh, emphasize what Ernst said. This was really a collective ef effort under uh, FEPS that, it, that uh, I played a, more of a mentor role, but it was a large group effort. Uh, and it had to be, because we were looking at the rules across 28 countries, across uh, the EU. We were trying to look at this both at the EU level, but also at the national level. Uh, and we, as you'll see in a moment, we were looking fairly comprehensively at all the micro, macro, social uh, rules uh, that related to the economy. Uh, and so it was more than any, any uh, single person could undertake. Um, and it was, uh, I, I think it was a, 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 it was a, 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 a very um, energizing uh, 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 project exercise. Uh, it was a very difficult one, uh, but I think in the end we, we managed to get it to work. Um, I want to spend a moment uh, about, uh, to, to emphasize uh, the particular moment at which uh, the Euro was created, because uh, so many of the rules of the Euro uh, were affected by that particular moment. If the euro had been founded a little bit earlier or a little bit later, I think uh, there would have been different rules. And uh, you might say it was just unfortunate that you, uh, that was 1992 uh, in the Maastricht that the timing of the construction of the euro occurred. So uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, capitalism, unbridled faith in markets, um, was understandable. The fall of the Berlin Wall seemed to represent the triumph of capitalism. But it wasn't really that. It was really the failure of communism, of a state-led uh, uh, system that uh, gave no opportunity for individual initiative. If the euro had been constructed a little earlier, say, uh, at the end of uh, the 20th century, the beginning of the 21st, the lessons of the East Asia crisis might have been more paramount. The East Asia crisis, these were countries which had low deficits, low debt, uh, they low inflation, they filled all the requirements of a good European country, but they had a massive crisis. And they, Europe would have learned that doing all those things did not protect you against the crisis. It might be necessary, but it clearly wasn't sufficient. And so uh, there would have been more caution about uh, the belief in, in the 2% the inflation, 3% deficit, and 60% debt rule. Um, if the euro had been constructed in 2009, 2010, after the financial crisis, uh, again, I think the euro would have been constructed on a different basis because you would have realized that unregulated, deregulated financial markets are a disaster. Uh, and that they are markets on their own are unstable. Um, and uh, you need uh, far more regulation. So it occurred at a particular moment of history, but unfortunately, the rules created were then hard to change. And particularly, this is one of the political flaws that it, may, it was particularly difficult within the construction of the Euro, or the, or the construction of the EU to change rules. So that necessitated, when we wrote the, uh, did the rewriting the rules of the European economy, uh, it necessitated our asking the questions, uh, two questions, both what can be done by a reinterpretation of existing rules, a re, a, a implementation of existing rules, and also what rules should be fundamentally changed. 
and addresses the questions both at the levels of the Eurozone and at national levels. The book describes both the ideas and the ideology behind many of the misguided rules and the new rules that will lead to a more prosperous Europe. Um, for instance, uh, at the time of the construction of the euro, there was a worry that excessive deficits and deficits in one country would lead to EU-wide inflation. This was a, viewed as a cross-border externality. That externality did not turn out to be significant. There is no instance of any debt or deficit in one country leading to European-wide inflation. Uh, in fact, inflation has not been a problem uh, for, uh, since the construction of, of the euro. But other cross-border externalities did turn out to be very important. One uh, that we wrote about in an op-ed uh, today was, uh, and was we talk about in the bu book, is that what I call, uh, in perhaps vivid, more vivid language than I should, is cross-border tax theft by Ireland and Luxembourg. Um, cross-border capital flows uh, exacerbated the downturns uh, in the crisis countries and uh, have led to divergence rather than the convergence that was uh, promised. So the book has uh, four parts. One is macroeconomics, one is microeconomics, one focuses on welfare and social protection, and one on the international aspects, globalization. Uh, let me cover them uh, very quickly so we're going to have time for some discussion. On the macroeconomics, uh, of course, we begin with the discussion of the Growth and Stability Pact uh, based on those three numbers that, that I mentioned before, 2%, 3%, and 60%. Uh, some of you may wonder, uh, if you aren't uh, students of economics, where did those numbers come from? And the answer was they were pulled out of the thin air. There was no scientific basis for them. There wasn't then, and there isn't now. So uh, why do people work so hard to achieve some goals that were pulled out of the thin air? Well, there are some people who believe once you have a rule, you should just obey it no matter how stupid the rule is. Uh, I think that's foolish. The, the answer is you should change the rule if it's foolish. Um, so um, the other critical problem uh, in macroeconomics is the central bank, the monetary policy. And here, the European Central Bank has uh, a single-minded focus on inflation. And as I mentioned before, inflation has not been a problem for a very long time. This contrasts uh, markedly with the mandate of, for instance, the Federal Reserve Board, which is growth, not only inflation, but also growth, employment, and financial stability. It may not have done a very good job in financial stability, but uh, it, it, it realizes that's part of its uh, obligations. The result of an excess of focus on inflation or a sole focus on inflation is that you have more unemployment in Europe than you otherwise would have. Uh, the most uh, tragic uh, and an uh, example of that was in 2011 when as the Eurozone was uh, going into crisis. Uh, the appropriate policy was to lower interest rates. That was going on in the United States. We had QE. What did Trichet do? Twice he raised interest rates because he was afraid of inflation. And he said, I have only one job, and that's inflation. If I think there's a da any danger of inflation, my responsibility is to raise inflation. Uh, so what if, the con if Europe goes into a crisis? That's not my job. My job is inflation. <laughs> well, uh, fortunately, the next head of the ECB had a broader interpretation of the mandate. And it, that illustrates that, that you can take existing rules and reinterpret them. Um, well, the result uh, of this narrow mandate was predictable, and again predicted, it was the hampered ability to respond to the crisis. 
But another problem in Europe's macroeconomic framework is that there has been an insufficient attention paid to investment both in the public and the private sector. And uh, the result has been there's been low investment, and that's hampered growth and productivity. So uh, what the book talks about is not only a need for reform on the existing institutions and rules, new mandates, new forms of governance of the ECB, but also creating new initiatives and new institutions, uh, strengthening, for instance, uh, the European Investment Bank, uh, and creating, uh, in, in the United States now, there are uh, new investment banks being created uh, to a deal with the transition to the green economy. And uh, those are ideas that one might want to explore uh, in Europe as well. Let me turn to the microeconomics. Here we deal with a whole range of uh, issues, competition, labor law, corporate governance, intellectual property, financial markets. <laughs> Uh, maybe I should just mention in terms of intellectual property, um, as, as Ernst mentioned, you can download this uh, on your uh, 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 computer. Uh, so we are not using uh, intellectual property. Uh, we want the ideas to be disseminated freely. And uh, our publisher in the United States, Norton, is perfectly comfortable with uh, access uh, of uh, these ideas uh, more widely. They want these ideas to be more widely uh, disseminated. So um, the idea that you have to have a restrictive intellectual property framework in order to uh, have the creation of ideas is just wrong. Um, and uh, I think those of us in the university believe that uh, universities work well in a spirit of open debate and openness, and that uh, laws uh, on intellectual property, particularly uh, in the United States, we have something called the Baidu Law, has had the effect of restraining uh, uh, free discourse um, because of worries about intellectual property. But I'm not going to talk about uh, uh, that uh, uh, this afternoon unless there are some questions. So in many of these areas of microeconomics, Europe has uh, done better than the United States, uh, but that's a very low bar. Uh, that's not saying very much. Um, um, and some of the areas where Europe's economic framework uh, was actually uh, better, has been better than the United States, uh, are under attack. I mentioned before shareholder capitalism. Uh, Europe, many European countries have uh, what is called stakeholder capitalism, and, and uh, there are many uh, attacks against uh, stakeholder capitalism. America's shareholder capitalism has led to excessive CEO pay and excessive uh, short-sightedness. I mentioned the short-sightedness. In terms of CEO pay, uh, our CEO pay uh, over the last, less than uh, about 35 years has gone up 1,000%. Um, many of the European CEOs look at envy uh, at this, and they believe this is a fundamental flaw in Europe. They, Europe should be imitating the United States, uh, but I think you should resist uh, that, uh, that call. Um, within Europe, uh, there are many differences uh, across countries, and that's important because I think uh, within Europe, one can lo look to the better performing countries uh, for lessons about what might work. Uh, there are two areas, I, let me just mention uh, very uh, briefly. One of them is monopoly power. And in my new book, uh, uh, People, Power, and Profits, uh, I try to present a, a whole framework for what a, has gone wrong and, and a prescription for uh, what to do about it. Um, one of the things I emphasize a great deal is the growth in market power. And I think everybody's familiar with it in the context of the five technology giants. But what isn't uh, so clear is if you look across the gamut of American industries, you see it from, you know, pet food, to drugstores, 
uh, in many cases, you may not even realize that you may think that there are many different drugstore companies. Uh, there's Walgreens and there's Dwayne Reed, but they're all the same company. They just use different names to confuse you and to hide the fact that there is only one, you know, there, there is such a degree of concentration. Um, uh, when you have that kind of market power, that gives them the power to raise prices. And when you raise prices, that eviscerates incomes just as much as lowering wages because you, it's the real income that you care about, the wages relative to prices, and if prices go up, your real income goes down. This market power is also helps explain this peculiar situation that we have in the United States and to some extent in Europe where profit rates are really high, historically very high, and investment rates are very low. And that's characteristic of monopolies. They, they look at the marginal returns, not the average returns. The marginal return is lower than the average return. And so they say, yes, we're making nice, uh, nice profits, but that's not the relevant issue. The question is, if we invest in more, it will uh, look, force us to lower prices, and our marginal return will be lower. So. Uh, the market power is both a cause of our low growth and uh, a uh, source of uh, inequality. And actually also impedes innovation because a lot of startups, and I spend uh, some time in Silicon Valley, a lot of startups say, you know, it doesn't pay us to start up because if we have a success, Facebook or Google will either copy us or buy us out. In fact, that's become the basic business model. You don't start a company to create a viable company. You buy, start a company to be bought out. And you know you won't get the full value, but you don't have to be that greedy. Instagram got a few billion dollars for 12 people. That's a lot of money. Um, uh, but if they had grown to their full potential, they would have been uh, even wealthier. But there was no need to get that agglomeration to have Facebook own Instagram and WhatsApp. Uh, that was an enormous concentration of market power, which our regulators should have stopped, but didn't. So that concentration of market power is one of the sources weakening our economy. At the other end, uh, is the bargaining power of workers, because that also has been weakened. Uh, and not only relative to uh, the corporations, but absolutely, partly as a result of globalization, partly as a result of uh, changing labor law, partly as a result of changes in the way bargaining occurs. The extent of the visceration of the uh, workers' bargaining power has not, in Europe has not been as bad as in the United States, but it's been pretty bad. Uh, it's, again, only one of degree, not uh, in, in direction. Um, well, the third part of the book it, it deals with the welfare state. A few people, including uh, uh, prominent people at the ECB, have wrongly accused the welfare state, uh, a too expansive welfare state, as the cause of the financial crisis of 2008. Uh, they were wrong. It was uh, no country that had a large financial, uh, a large welfare state like the Scandinavian countries uh, went into a major crisis. The crisis was caused by excessive financialization and underregulated financial institutions. And the people in the ECB who tried to blame the welfare state were just trying to do two things, to shift the blame and to pursue their ideological agenda. And, <laughs> it's interesting also that the remedy that they often accuse is not only weakening the welfare state, but also lowering wages. Again, it wasn't too high wages that caused the problems uh, in Europe. It was uh, the weakening. Uh, uh, wages have not even kept up with productivity over the last 
15 years. Uh, it was uh, uh, financialization. In fact, the welfare state acted as an automatic stabilizer and provided an important cushion in the crisis. In the absence uh, of the welfare state, the economic downturn in Europe would have been far worse. So the implication is uh, that we needed to strengthen the welfare state. But austerity has weakened the welfare state. And today, it needs to be reinvigorated and reinvented in the 21st, for the 21st century. Now, a 21st century welfare state is about more than social protection and more, about more than uh, providing, in the case of unemployment, disability, retirement. Uh, it's a system of investment in people, ensuring that everyone, regardless of the parent's income and education, has an opportunity, uh, is given the education, access to health services, and housing that is necessary. Um, the final part of the book is about globalization. Even if globalization is not the only or even the most important source of the problem uh, that Europe confronts today, it has contributed to inequality and unemployment uh, in ways that I've already described. The problem, though, was not so much with globalization itself, but with the way it was managed, as I've written about in several of my books. Uh, it was managed for corporate interests, and if you look at the way the negotiations occur, who's at the table, it becomes very clear. Now, that's very different from the story that you hear from uh, America's president, uh, who uh, says that globalization, our trade agreements, uh, were unfair to the United States. Uh, and the way he tells the story, it's as if our trade negotiators got snookered by those smart guys from developing countries. <laughs> now, you know, I've talked to trade ministers from South Africa, from other countries around the world, and uh, they will tell you the United States got almost everything, if not everything, they asked for. Uh, we were not snookered. The problem was we were asking for the wrong things. And what we were asking for was actually shaped by our corporations because they were at the table. They were asking for provisions, for instance, extending um, uh, the effect of uh, patent protection through a provision called data exclusivity so that it would reduce access to life-saving generic medicines. We didn't ask for that. I mean, it, it wasn't developing countries that were asking for this. It was our drug companies that were asking for it. And not all of our drug companies. It was our big pharma that was asking for this. It was a big debate. More than 80% of all American drugs are produced by generics. But their profits are low because they're very competitive or more competitive. But the big profits are in big pharma. And big profits were associated with big lobbying. And big lobbying meant the big pharma was at the table when the trade negotiations were under negotiation. And so we got these trade agreements that reduce access to life-saving medicines uh, in developing countries, but reciprocally also in the United States. So there are two sets of reforms that are necessary in globalization, reforms to better cope with globalization. And here we fix them with what I just talked about, strengthening systems of social protection, um, active labor market policies to help people move uh, from uh, uh, less competitive to more competitive sectors, industrial policies, including place-based policies, uh, which are just the opposite of neoliberalism. And secondly, we need reforms to uh, change the rules of globalization, um, and the book provides a comprehensive agenda covering every aspect of globalization. Most importantly, uh, we need to deal with climate change. Here, let me just uh, have a, just a minute of digression. The Green New Deal, uh, which has gotten a lot of attention in the United States, is right in emphasizing the urgency and the scale 
It's right in emphasizing that it will require massive resource mobilization. It's right in emphasizing that we can take advantage of this to restructure our economy, to provide new opportunities for all, to reduce discrimination, and promote inclusion and equality. So uh, this is uh, an important part of uh, what uh, needs to be done going forward. So let me uh, conclude. Rewriting the rules for Europe provides, I hope, a comprehensive and coherent agenda for Europe <laughs> to create the shared prosperity that has been part of the dream of Europe since the beginning of the European project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, for your insights. Um, of course, uh, to, to rewrite the rules, you also need a, like a political majority to, to write those new rules. We are working on that. Um, Professor Stieglitz um, uh, told us that uh, he was not the only author of this report. He was like uh, the most important um, uh, brain behind that, but there were um, there were numerous uh, outstanding scholars, outstanding economists, uh, who also um, uh, wrote some parts of this of this report. One of them, uh, one of the Austrian uh, contributors, was Margit Ratzenstaller, who I don't have to uh, introduce. Uh, very deeply because she's a well-known expert on both fiscal policy, uh, also budget policy, also and but also tax policy, and I think this was uh, the field she was specializing in in this report. And I would like to, before we um, give the floor to the audience to ask questions, I would like to give the floor to Margit Ratzenstaller to. Uh, to comment uh, uh, on uh, Professor Stieglitz's speech uh, and to bring her views and her, um, her part of the report uh, on the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria, for the friendly uh, introduction. And thank you very much for the invitation to, uh, to this uh, nice event. Uh, it's a great honor and pleasure for me to share with you some thoughts about taxation in the European uh, context. Uh, thanks for leaving this out. So I have some uh, space now to share my thoughts uh, on this. I think one of the most pressing uh, and most important um, issues and topical issues that rewriting the rules uh, of the European economy is focusing on. And also, I think that the often heard assertion um, that the scope for national tax policy has been extremely restricted by the increasing integration of economies and the mobility of tax bases, I think it's kind of exaggerated, but there cannot be any serious doubt that EU-wide coordination of tax policy is required in certain fields as a prerequisite to use the leverage that taxation offers in theory to contribute to sustainable growth and development in the European Union. Um, in the Horizon 2020 EU project Fair Tax that we have just finalized with WIFO as one uh, of 10 partners and whose results were very useful inputs for the chapter on taxation in rewriting the rules, we have identified various what we call sustainability gaps uh, in European uh, taxation. One is uh, that the tax burden on labor um, is high. Uh, another one is that the share of environmental taxes is decreasing. Um, the overall progressivity of tax systems, that was uh, said already, uh, is increasing. Uh, there are several reasons uh, for that. One is uh, falling top income tax rates and falling uh, corporate income tax rates. Another one is the dualization of income tax systems all over European um, countries. In most uh, EU countries, capital incomes are taxed at much lower rates uh, than earned incomes. And also due to the ongoing erosion uh, of taxes on uh, inheritance and wealth. Um, Another sustainability gap, um, and it was mentioned already before, is that multinational contribution to member states' tax revenues is decreasing due to profit shifting and also due to falling corporate income tax rates. And there are gender imbalances um, in taxation. For example, a high tax burden on labor income of second earners. The Austrian tax system 
um, is no exception. Um, it also shows various considerable sustainability um, gaps. Uh, Austria has a tax, a very high tax burden. Um, they were well above um, the UVA average and well above the OECD average. Um, Austria has just moderate and decreasing environmental taxes. Wealth-based taxes uh, play a very small and decreasing role uh, in Austria. The net wealth tax was abolished um, in 1993 already. Um, the inheritance tax was terminated in 2008, and the local property tax base is rather outdated. Austria also has um, a dualized income tax system with capital income tax rates ranging from 25% uh, to about 45% compared to a top income tax rate of 55%. And finally, there are gender imbalances uh, in taxation which are caused by various provisions that are supporting a rather unequal distribution of paid and unpaid work uh, between men and women in Austria. The existing sustainability gaps in European um, taxation have um, considerable undesired, I would say, and undesirable consequences. One is that the growth and employment friendliness of taxation is impaired. Um, another one is that domestic small and medium-sized uh, enterprises are put at a disadvantage. Um, the potential of corrective taxes, um, for example, environmental taxes, is underused. Tax morale is eroded. People are increasingly getting the impression that multinationals don't contribute their fair share uh, to the financing of welfare states. The potential um, of the tax system as an important instrument for redistribution is decreasing in the long term. And in a number of countries, tax systems are also enforcing exist agenda, existing gender inequalities. And the crucial, crucial question, of course, is now how can we close these sustainability gaps in European uh, taxation? And there are basically three pillars to secure sustainability orientation at European taxation at the EU level. The first pillar is the introduction of effective minimum tax rates for corrective taxes, taxes on uh, environmental use, but also taxes on alcohol uh, consumption and tobacco consumption. The second pillar is to harmonize corporate income taxation, and the third pillar is the introduction of what we call sustainability-oriented tax-based on resources as innovative financial sources for the EU budget. Uh, there's not much time left, but I will take uh, another two or three minutes, if I may, uh, to talk about the second and the third pillar in a bit more detail. I'd like to start with uh, corporate taxation in Europe, um, which is characterized basically by two problems. Um, the first one is profit shifting. Um, there are various channels via which multinationals uh, shift their profits to low-tax um, countries to minimize their overall uh, tax burden, um, which causes considerable uh, tax losses. We have various uh, recent studies on um, the uh, extent of these tax losses. For example, according to the OECD BEPS project, um, in 2015, uh, it was calculated that profit shifting costs about 4 to 10 percent of corporate tax revenues on average for OECD countries. Uh, there is a study by the IMF estimating that uh, from 1980 uh, to 2012, uh, profit shifting on average resulted in a loss of 5 percent of corporate tax revenues for 51 countries that were included in the study. And even more, for developing countries, uh, the average tax loss is about 13%. And there's also a study that was recently conducted for the European Parliament. Um, and according to this um, uh, study, 72 billion in corporate tax revenues um, were lost for EU member states uh, in the period uh, from 2009 to 2013 as a result of profit shifting. The second problem in corporate taxation in Europe is an intense tax competition via nominal tax rates, um, which has caused the EU 28 average um, nominal CIT rate to fall from 35% to, uh, to, to 22% sorry, between 1995 and 2018. In the old European uh, countries, the average uh, corporate income tax rate went down from 38 to 25%. In the new EU countries, it decreased from 31 to 18%. We have a de considerable decrease of these uh, corporate income tax rates. Um, to ensure an adequate contribution um, from corporate income taxation um, to government fin finance is also in the future. 
uh, I think we need harmonization uh, resting on two pillars. The first one is the introduction of a harmonized tax base um, plus formula apportionment of the consolidated profits to um, those countries where multinationals are active. This is a proposal that has been uh, put forward by the European Commission uh, since 20 years and is still debated uh, on the EU level. Plus, what we also need, um, which is not suggested by the European Commission, is the introduction of a minimum corporate income tax rate as the harmonized tax base uh, might otherwise even increase um, tax competition uh, among member states. Um, the second thing I want very briefly would like uh, to elaborate very briefly a bit is um, that another element of future-proof taxation in the EU is the introduction of so-called tax-based owned resources to finance the EU uh, budget. These could uh, replace a part uh, of national contributions uh, by member states to um, the EU budget, and particularly well suited for those for, for, thus, for such tax-based owned resources are taxes that cannot be enforced effectively um, at the national level. For example, fi a financial transaction tax is also uh, suggested by the European Commission, a flight ticket tax, a border carbon adjustment for, uh, for the European um, uh, for the emission trading system, and an EU-wide net wealth tax uh, that we have also uh, elaborated on and analyzed in our project. Um, to come to an end, um, I think it's most important that member states see that uh, future-proof national tax systems crucially depend on European cooperation in tax matters. Of course, uh, the formal sovereignty of member states uh, in the area uh, of taxation must be given up to a certain degree uh, for harmonization and cooperation agreements. Uh, however, this would enhance the effective sovereignty for member states to make their tax systems fit to address the grand societal changes uh, Europe is facing and to, to, to support the urgently uh, needed, and Ulrike Schneider uh, pointed that out before, the very urgently needed sustainability transformation uh, in Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Margit. Um, we would like to give the floor to the audience now, and I um, think it would be the best to collect a few comments and questions uh, to our two uh, experts. Thank you very much for your presentation and also for your comment. Um, I applaud uh, your contribution. I mean, even the title, I think, is fantastic. And congratulate your enthusiastical and holy uh, to the book. However, I have one complaint. And that is, why does climate change start to be discussed on page 162 out of 163? It says there, it says there, addressing climate change is an existential issue for the world. And we start discussing that on the almost last page. That is a bit strange. And it's framed as a public good, uh, which uh, contributions are difficult to collect. The dominant strategy is a free rider, and we need a global coordination mechanism. Yep, it would be great to have that. It's not in sight. Hence, we need a rethink. Uh, you also said that uh, if we have goals that are obviously not working, uh, then maybe we should not continue to pursue them. I would suggest that something that's called sustainable growth is a goal that's not working. I would suggest to rethink that and start uh, um, addressing other goals, such as increasing human well-being, reducing social inequality, and staying within biophysical boundaries. I'm looking forward to your answer. Do I stand up? Or, um, I stand up, yeah. Uh, so this is a small comment, really. Um, you mentioned the beginning of your presentation 
um, Roosevelt and the antitrust laws. You mentioned toward the end the concentration of the, the corporations that we see in the world. And in the middle, you mentioned your newfound friend, the CEO of uh, BlackRock. <laughs> <laughs> now, it turns out that he seems to be, uh, or BlackRock seems to be a major shareholder in almost any corporation that we have these days. Uh, whenever I see in our here announcements, just like recently, Sony and Microsoft working together, Volkswagen and Ford working together, I always wonder if that is not even the bigger evil than just the single corporation uh, trying to exercise its monopoly power. In a way, collusion between corporations driven by sort of the shareholder, and it's a singular word that I'm using here, uh, trying uh, convincing them to collude because obviously competition in prices for companies that are owned by the same shareholders is much less imminent. So wouldn't that be a bigger problem? And uh, I haven't read the book, uh, not up to page 162, but uh, um, so, so I wonder if you, if you address that issue there. Thank you. Uh, hello. I'm a technician. Maybe I don't use the right terms, but for my impression, we have in the economics two schools. One tells us expanding the money volume uh, is a big problem and, f and leads to a disaster. On the other hand, we have the opposite uh, opinion. Uh, expanding the money volume is no problem. Uh, for both, we have examples. We have uh, uh, disaster uh, states by restrictions of expanding the, the money volu volume. And on the other hand, we have since 30 uh, years Japan expanding the money, money volume very strongly and it needs also to a disaster. Uh, what is your opinion in this uh, uh, two schools? I'm Ludwig. Thank you for your uh, uh, exciting talk. Uh, my question is, from where do you expect more support for rewriting the rules? From policy, as we see it today, or from business? Hi. Thank you. Um, I also have a question. Uh, so, throughout history, uh, we have always witnessed period of economic growth and then economic decline, no matter what the set of economic rules there were in that period. Um, for example, after the Second World War, there was a lot of growth because there was a lot of potential for growth. And then problems came, then another set of rules came, and Soviet Union, for example, at the beginning was a massive success, there was a lot of economic gro growth, and then it turned out that that system was also problematic. Massive deregulation of markets also brought economic growth. And then also that turned out to be a failure. So my question is, how powerful is the set of economic rules uh, against the circumstances? And how much uh, circumstances matter? Thank you. We take one more and then we go back to Professor Stiglitz. I also have a small question. Um, you mentioned the EU, EU rules, like the 3% deficit rule, 60% 60, 60 debt rule, and that those were picked out of thin air, kind of. Do you have any, I haven't read the book, but maybe you provide them, do you have any alternative ideas how to find such thresholds? And also with, repart, uh, with regard to public debt, do you believe that there even should be a threshold also with respect to modern mon monetary theory? Thank you. I, I give the Okay. Uh, okay, I have about six minutes to answer all the questions, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to do, go as fast as I can. Uh, the, the book is obviously shaped a little bit uh, by uh, history, the process uh, that, uh, at the time in which we began thinking about the, uh, and uh, at that point, austerity, the, the, you might say the death of, of a, uh, the, the struggles of a, of a large part of Europe were, were paramount in our mind, which is why uh, we, we began with the macroeconomic framework and, uh, and austerity. Um, I think uh, today, 
I think we would uh, clearly begin with the, uh, the focus on climate change. And I, I think if we do another edition, uh, your suggestion will be uh, front and center of what, uh, what we do. Uh, and it's why I talked about the Green New Deal uh, 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 as part of my talk. It really is central. It, it is an existential issue. And one of the things I try to emphasize in my remarks at the end is I, I think the the, the framework of, of the Green New Deal of bringing in uh, the war again to protect the, uh, the planet uh, living within our biosphere is part of uh, the fundamental, uh, 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 can be uh, central to the fundamental reforms of our society and our economy. And the new rules will actually have to make that uh, uh, front and center. Um, the, um, question of um, uh, whether shareholders uh, collude together uh, and is uh, a major source of problem, particularly when you have uh, a, a few shareholders, uh, BlackRock and uh, uh, Fidelity owning significant amounts, um, has been a subject of a lot of debate and discussion in the United States. Uh, there are empirical studies that seem to suggest that there is some evidence of, uh, of an effect along the lines that you said, but no one's been able to establish any mechanism by which that has occurred. No evidence of any actual transmission of any constructions of that kind. So while there are some people who look at the data and say you can see the evidence, uh, you can see it in, in the in the outcomes, you can't see it in any process. So that is why it's really remaining a subject of a lot of, of uh, controversy. Um, I don't know whether we talk about it in the book. Uh, I can't remember that. On the question about whether uh, uh, we think we're going to get uh, the most uh, support from business or policymakers, um, I don't think CEOs are going to uh, support uh, some of our recommendations about curbing CEO pay. Um, but uh, I actually think that uh, both civil society and policymakers uh, will find our report uh, very uh, interesting. I think from the point of view of policymakers, we, we wrote it partly uh, when we did it, the United States version was really trying to give, we wrote it for two audiences. Uh, one, to give some of our uh, legislatures uh, uh, an agenda um, of what are the things that they ought to be thinking about, like uh, in in terms of uh, corporate governance, um, more uh, worker uh, uh, say in corporate governance, and uh, more attention to uh, worker shareholder. Uh, uh, ideas and, and uh, other forms of corporate governance, uh, explore other corporate uh, governance, and, and uh, it has gotten some resonance there. In terms of civil society, um, the obviously the focus that we've uh, placed on enhancing workers' bargaining power and the mechanisms has obviously been taken up a lot by uh, those who are concerned about workers, including uh, obviously the unions. Um, the question on, uh, uh, well, I think if I understood the question on monetary uh, policy, uh, that is again a, a complicated one. We've gotten a, a lot of attention in the United States with MMT, the modern monetary theory. Um, the, I think the wrong lesson is being drawn. Many people actually are saying, uh, mon modern monetary theory is actually old monetary theory. Uh, what we discovered in uh, the years after the Great uh, Recession is that you could increase enormously base money, the uh, base money, the, 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 the reserves of the Federal Reserve and the ECB and the Bank of Japan increased enormously it didn't have any inflationary effects because it didn't have any effect on uh, economic demand. It did have a big effect on asset values. And in that way led to a lot of wealth inequality 
uh, because the shareholder values went way up, uh, and uh, those who owned shares, which were disproportionately people at the top of the income distribution, uh, became wealthier. So monetary policy did contribute a lot to uh, wealth inequality. It didn't stimulate the economy, and because it didn't stimulate the economy, did not lead to uh, inflation. But if we enter an era like the United States is where excess supply is more limited, um, the, we still have some excess uh, supply. We have some uh, ability to grow without inflation, but how much, we don't know. Somewhere between 5 and 10 percent, but not much more than that. And so the worry is that if we went beyond that, we would begin to uh, have inflation and that we really need to redeploy resources, some of which we can do by uh, redeploying resources from fossil fuel and from dirty industries and moving them to, to clean industries. So there's plenty of room for redeployment as well as uh, using more resources. Um, this is also where the Green New Deal comes in because they emphasize that um, our markets have been marked by uh, extensive discrimination and exclusion. And if we reduce the degree of discrimination, increase more uh, time flexibility in the labor market, uh, make some other reforms in the labor market, we would be able, at least over the medium term, uh, to use our resources uh, much more fully, and that would give, uh, enable us to, to expand uh, our output. Um, the question about uh, to what extent are uh, the fluctuations due to, in, the, in, the, in economic growth, uh, are due to uh, the rules, the policies, or to the circumstances, is really an interesting question. Um, I believe very strongly, I mean, obviously both are important, but if you look around the world today, you see countries in very similar economic circumstances. Uh, that is to say, many of the different advanced countries are confronting technological change, globalization, aging population, uh, the uh, demographic transition, the green transition. They're all facing the same circumstances, but the outcomes are markedly different. Why does the United States have so much more inequality why is our life expectancy going down? Why is our opportunity so low? Why is our growth uh, so limited? It's all because of the wrong policies. So I don't, you know, when I look at the United States compared to some of the best performing countries, it is clearly due to uh, uh, our policies. After World War II, uh, we uh, had a debt GDP ratio that was much higher than we have today. And that re relates to the last question. Uh, and we managed to grow faster. So it wasn't the circumstance of having uh, high debt. Uh, we had accumulated that debt to fight a war. So it wasn't like we had uh, gotten the debt because we were investing in our infrastructure or uh, anything like that. We were spending the money to win the war. Uh, and yet, it was the period of our fastest economic growth. And why was that? It was partly because government during the war did a lot of research. The basis of that research led to faster economic growth. Now, you can't predict when your research is going to produce something that's really important. So that's the way in which circumstances. But you can have uh, an innovation and use it or not use it. It took a long time for electricity to be fully implemented. It could have been done faster, and that was a matter of policies. We didn't have rural electrification in the United States until FDR came along and said, we're going to electrify the country. We could have done it 20 years earlier, but we didn't have a president that made this a mobilization effort to, to do that. So that's the final question. In terms of debt rules, there's no magic formula, but it really depends on what you use the money for. If you use the money for investing in your economy, you're going to wind up with a stronger economy. 
Uh, if you want, uh, use the money and you waste it, you're obviously going to be in a bad shape. So it really, the issue is really uh, one of, of the use to which you put the money. Thank you. Before the professor has to jump into his car, I have one final question to Margit Ratzenstelle because she um, is working on climate issues and environmental issues for many years. Uh, what would be your top priority right now to uh, tackle these issues? Well, there's not the one single instrument that everybody knows uh, who is dealing with climate change and Sigrid uh, over there knows that best. Um, and, and thanks for that criticism. Um, with regard to taxation uh, system, I think the carbon uh, taxes, I think the, the most urgent uh, and important thing that we would need now. Um, but without saying that um, there's a lot of other tax-based instrument that we would need. And there's a focus on... Um, carbon emissions currently, which I think is an absolutely um, necessary focus, but it's not the only environmental um, uh, problem that we have. So, thank you very much. We have to end here. Thank you, Professor Stieglitz. Applause for, for you. And <laughs> Margit Schatzenstaller. We hope to welcome you back soon here in Vienna. Uh, have a good trip and thank you everybody for coming and for listening. <laughs>